All right, let's go ahead and get started. It seems like the participant numbers have kind of leveled off. Um, thank you again for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Adam Betchwell. Again, I'm the Conservation Director for Georgia Audubon. And this evening, we're going to talk about birds and buildings. Um, I'm going to talk to you about why this is a threat, why are buildings so, such a big problem for birds, um, what's being done about it, both here in Georgia and, and across the country, and then the many ways that you can help birds uh, in relation to buildings from becoming a volunteer for us, uh, as well as doing things at your home. So we have an hour and a half blocked off. Um, I know it's a good bit of time uh, for most of you. The first 45 minutes to an hour are gonna be kind of my basic, not basic, but I'm gonna dive into to this issue, why it happens and, and what birds we have found here in Atlanta. And then the last bit is gonna be more geared towards uh, training or going over some of the resources for volunteers. So. If you are a returning volunteer or if you're interested in participating this fall um, or even next spring, uh, I'm going to go into how we do that and some of the resources available. So I understand that some of you don't make it the whole time, but if you do want to learn more about being active with us, uh, the end of the presentation is, is just for that. One thing I just want to make sure I also plug um, all the other things that we have going on, you know, fall migrations coming up, uh, our Georgia Bird Fest. Uh, is set to start next month. We have registration open for many events and webinars, so I encourage you to check that out. We have stuff all over the state. We have things that are in person. We have things that are completely virtual, so whatever you're comfortable doing, I encourage you to look for those. We have an exciting uh, webinar with Doug Callamy, uh, the entomologist and, and author, uh, next month. I believe that's on September 17th, so if you go to our education tab on our website, which is georgeaudubon.org, and look for the digital resources um, link. You'll find all of our upcoming webinars as well as recordings of past webinars, um, ranging from our hummingbird talk to me talking about some of my travels to Paraguay and Michigan and everywhere in between. So uh, we appreciate you paying attention and checking us out and, and please continue to do so. Um, so let me go ahead and get, get diving in here on the issue of birds and buildings. Before that, I want to give you a little background about Georgia Audubon in case you happen to be new to our organization. Um, well, Georgia Audubon itself is, is brand new. We're only a couple weeks old, um, but Atlanta Audubon, uh, our former name, um, it goes all the way back to the 1920s when we had the Atlanta Bird Club. Um, in the 70s, we changed our name and became part of the National Audubon Society Larger Network. And in general, we are a member-supported staff nonprofit. Uh, we are the only staffed Audubon chapter in the state and now that we have this statewide mission, uh, we hope to provide support uh, to the local volunteer chapters across our state and carry out our conservation, education, and community outreach programs to a much broader, uh, broader audience. We wanna help make uh, Georgia a better place for birds and, and build places where both birds and people thrive. That's our larger mission. And, and one thing I, I failed to mention at the beginning, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please feel free to use the question and answer tool or the comment box, uh, don't hesitate to fire in my way and I will get to them as quickly as possible. And so when we're trying to build places where both birds and people thrive, what birds are we talking about? Um, over 400 species have been found here in our great state of Georgia. And that is attributed to our diversity of habitats, um, to many unique breeding species that we have and some rare habitats. Um, some that are rare now that used to not be so rare like longleaf pine. Um, we have, you know, parcels of that left mainly in wildlife management areas and state parks, such as the Piedmont National Wildlife uh, Refuge down by Macon. Uh, and in those habitats, you get specialized birds like red cockaded woodpecker and Bachman sparrow. Georgia is lucky to have such an intact salt marsh compared to many other Atlantic states. And so in those marshes, we have seaside and salt marsh and Nelson sparrows and amazing roseate spoonbills like the bird photo. Um, and then we have, you know, the, the North Georgia mountains, the Blue Ridge the lush Piedmont and then the coastal plains. So we have a lot of different habitats. Um, we're a big state and so we're home to many birds and we're also kind of sitting at this convergence of migratory routes. So the timing of this webinar has to do with fall migration and many birds are going to come down through Georgia and either fly across the Gulf of Mexico or go down through peninsular Florida and into the Caribbean. Um, and it's same in the spring we have so many birds that are either going around the Gulf and cutting east to Georgia flying over the Gulf, which is such an amazing journey that these little birds take, or coming up through the islands and through Florida. So we have a lot going on 
uh, here in our state when it comes uh, to bird migration. And specifically here in Atlanta, I'm sure we have people tuning in from outside of Atlanta, but here in Atlanta, we're uh, lucky to have such a, an intact tree canopy. You know, we're the city in the forest here in Atlanta. And so we have a lot of birds that use uh, the habitat here in our metro area from that Chattahoochee River National Recreation Area is a fantastic spot to find birds. Kennesaw Mountain is known as a famous migratory stopover spot. So in spring and in fall, you can get out there and find, you know, 20 plus species of warblers if you're lucky on a good day. Piedmont Park, um, with it being so urban, uh, it's, it's a hot spot or a great spot for birds to, to stop over uh, during migration. And over 170 species have been found at Piedmont Park. And this really drives from the point that urban spaces are valuable for birds. Um, we do have our breeders like cardinals and thrashers and towhees and chickadees, but migrants need those refuges as well when they're migrating. And it's not just during migration, it's not just in Atlanta. So if you happen to be tuning in from Macon or Athens or anywhere else, uh, even a more rural destination, you know, the green spaces around our homes and our buildings are crucial for our birds. And why do birds matter? If you're here, you're probably a bird lover, or at least bird curious, and uh, you might have your own reasons to care about birds. Uh, but birds are culturally important. They inspire us. They're important for many religions. I mean, it's hard to not be just, you know, dumbfounded or awestruck when you see a painted bunting like that bird on the left down on the Georgia coast or a northern gannet on the right when they're diving out into the ocean. Um, so with their ability to fly, birds just mean so much to us in, in many different ways. They provide so many important ecosystems or eco services, excuse me. Uh, they're seed dispersers. They're our cleaning crews. You know, if we didn't have people constantly scraping up uh, animals from the side of the road, um, the vultures are there to do that for us. That's why you don't frequently find dead animals lying around. They serve as pest management. You know, down on our coffee farms in Central America, they're there eating the borer beetles that are trying to ruin the product of the crop. And, you know, the reality of the food chain, they're a food source for many larger organisms as well. And each species plays its role. Even something kind of nondescript like this orange crowned warbler has its vital, you know, roles that it plays uh, in our larger food web and in our ecosystem. So birds matter for, for many reasons. Another thing which you all might be familiar with is birds mean business. Birds are big bucks. So According to the Fish and Wildlife uh, Service, there's over 40 million bird watchers in the United States. And some of those uh, might be like you and just look at your bird feeders out back. And some of them might be like me and travel across the globe wherever I can get to, uh, to look for new birds. And when we do that, we have our scopes and our binoculars and our cameras and our killie hats and, and, and khaki clothing, whatever our birding uniform might be. And we, you know, we eat at local restaurants and buy gas and so, um, billions and billions of dollars uh, of our U.S. economy are tied up in the bird world. And so that's kind of my job here uh, at Georgia Audubon is I want to conserve these birds. I want to make Georgia a more welcoming place for birds and I want to do to do my best to keep their numbers stable or increase them uh, however I can. And so we do that through habitat restoration, through getting more native plants in the ground, community science and monitoring programs. So getting people out to look for bluebirds as part of our climate watch surveys or to construct chimney swift towers to help those birds. Those are some of our species specific initiatives. We do education work and advocacy, community outreach. But what's kind of become my baby over these past few years is this topic of birds in buildings, which is you know, something that most people don't know about and, and don't understand the scale, uh, which is something why I think it's so important to educate people because it's happening all around us and just many people have no idea uh, what's going on and how problematic it really is. So I'm gonna to try to play this video for you. Hopefully it, it won't blare some music. If it does play music, I apologize, so be ready just in case. So what do I mean? What's happening with birds and buildings? This is kind of a, an example. These people are trying to help this amazing red start and they let it go and it flies right into that pane of glass which is really unfortunate. They were doing all they could to try to help that little bird. Um, and it, it did not perceive that glass or it did not understand that there was a barrier there. And that's kind of the, the main issue that's going on with birds and buildings. It's mainly the glass. And it happens a lot. Um, so the best data we have suggests that 365 million 
to almost a billion, billion birds a year die in the U.S. alone. It's the third leading cause of bird death behind habitat loss and outdoor cats. So it's a major toll uh, on our avian life. And this is a, a striking male Baltimore Oriole that we found on Georgia Tech's campus a couple years ago. And I know it's hard. People don't want to see photos of injured or dead birds. So there aren't many in here, but this is a just a stunning bird that unfortunately met its demise on campus when it was migrating from the tropics uh, back up to the, the Midwest or somewhere in the Northeast. So this is a major source of mortality for our bird life, especially our migrants. And just to give you an idea, so some of these, these data sources are, could probably be updated, um, but things that you hear about that definitely pose uh, threats to birds from wind turbines to cell towers and power lines. I mean, those are still big numbers, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions um, of birds, but nothing like uh, the toll that buildings and glass take on birds. And then of course, as I mentioned, cats is one of the few sources of mortality that is above buildings. But it is a huge, huge issue that we have. And while the data is, there's a lot of variance in those numbers, um, even on the low end, it's a staggering number of birds in our country. So why is this happening? How, how are birds, you know, encountering buildings and, and why can't they safely maneuver around them? Um, it's kind of a two-pronged uh, answer, a two-pronged approach. One has to do with nocturnal light. So many people don't know that a lot of our birds migrate at night. And so right now, um, you know, we're, we're at the very beginning of fall migration. Some shorebirds are moving. We're getting a little bit of songbird movement going on here in Georgia. And a lot of those birds take off at night. They use the setting sun and the stars as some of their navigational tools, along with you know, the magnetic field and geographic, you know, physical landmarks. But they set off at night frequently. And here's a, a really cool thing. If you don't know much about weather radar and how it's used for, for birds, those pulses of blue that are circular are birds moving. That's not weather. So you can see the precipitation moving to the east in the yellows and in the greens. But those blue circles are from weather stations picking up a mass of birds moving. This is from a spring migration period in late April. And so we get an idea of how many birds and where they're moving. And here's similar information from weather radar stations, which are the green dots. The red line is sunset. And so you can see after dark hits, when it gets bluer in the southeast there, that's indicating birds beginning to move northbound. So birds are moving at night, millions and millions. And especially in the fall, we have all these young birds that are now going to migrate south in addition to the adults that survived the breeding season. So, so many billions of birds are going to be flying south um, over the next few months. And what we know now is birds are attracted and confused by nocturnal light. You know, they use those stars, they use other, the setting sun, as I mentioned, and when they come over a bright place like Atlanta, they don't know what's going on and, and many species are kind of sucked in and confused by those lights. Now, occasionally a bird might fly into a light source, and I'll give you some examples of really strong light and how that affects birds. But what's more common is they're pulled into somewhere they shouldn't be. And when that happens, they encounter the real problem, which is reflective or transparent glass. So if you're a bird, if you're a little black and white warbler, and you land in that tree on the left side of the left photo, and then you see a reflection of the same tree, you chose that tree because it provided some shelter to you or it had some good food or something about it pulled you in. Maybe you were just desperate. And then you see a reflection of the same tree, you're probably gonna be drawn to that as well. And in the reflection, the tree still looks 10, 20, 30 feet away. And so if you're not expecting a barrier and you think you're 20 feet away from that tree, you're gonna be moving at a high speed and that's when a lot of collisions occur. And we really like our glass uh, in our modern architecture and so there's more and more of this mirrored surface out there, which can be can problematic uh, for our birds. However, it's not just reflective glass. Transparency in the right situation can be bad news. So uh, glass walkways like this or skywalks, especially up in more northern climates like the Twin Cities or New York, if there's a glass walkway between two, two buildings, a bird might not perceive the glass at all and think it's just a clear flyway and then they can collide with the surface then. Uh, even glass corners of buildings can be problematic. So glass is really tricky for our birds. And it's tricky for a few reasons um, that I'm going to tell you. And one of it, and one of the reasons starts with their vision. 
um, you know, birds see the world a little bit differently than we do in, in a couple key ways, some good, some bad. And so one way that we think it might play a role you know, with them colliding with buildings is the positioning of their eyes. And so in that image in the bottom left, if you think about where our eyes are located, they're right on the front of our face, and we can see very well right in front of us in our binocular vision, but maybe not as good on the periphery. But birds, most of them, their eyes are much further back on the side of their face, especially kind of extreme examples of maybe a woodcock or a snipe where they're way far back. And so they can see great, you know, predators coming from overhead or even behind them, um, but they actually don't see that great right in front of them. And so that can, can be an issue when you're thinking about a surface that they're not going to perceive or would struggle to perceive anyways as a collision risk um, because of where their eyes are. Now, one thing that birds can do is they can see in the UV spectrum. And we humans cannot, at least most birds can see in the UV spectrum. And so this is kind of an interesting thing I'm going to talk about in ways to make our buildings safer is taking advantage of this ability to see UV light um, to allow humans to keep the aesthetic that we like in our buildings but maybe provide some relief to the birds that are in the habitats around those spaces. And one thing where maybe uh, us humans have uh, a leg up on birds is in our contrast perception. So we can pick up contrast uh, a bit better than birds. And so when we're thinking about how can we reduce the reflection and, and the threat of certain surfaces, contrast is really vital. And I'm going to talk about that as well as we continue. One thing I like to point out is, you know, when I talk about birds running the glass, you know, if you don't know much about birds, you might go, man, how could they be so stupid? How do they not know that that's something there? But we're not so great with glass either. And there are plenty of examples, especially if you want to kill some time on YouTube, of people walking into glass. Um, and the reason this doesn't happen as often as it does with birds is we have learned cues. We understand architecture. We can look at that picture on the left and we know that those are doors and that there is glass likely between those, you know, wooden frames. And we look to the image on the right and we can tell from those beams and from that row of dots, there's probably glass there. That's probably not open. And so we expect it to be there and we don't run into it. But if you look at some of these, you know, newer Apple buildings or Google headquarters, there's a lot of transparent glass and there's lots of cases of people running into those and being uh, having to go to the hospital or the ER because of that. So we just know things uh, that birds don't because of the cues we've learned when we built these buildings. And to prove that point, if I were to show you this photo and I remove those cues, are you looking at a tree? Are you looking at a reflection off of a very reflective surface? Or are you looking through glass to the view outside? You can't really say once I remove those cues from this image. But if I tell you that, that sure looks like a reflection. And you can see the outline of the glass and you can tell from the way it's kind of being reflected that it's not a, you know, an in-person upfront image. So, you know, birds aren't silly. They're just trying to adapt to our very modern um, expansion of the use of our glass. Birds don't understand architecture. They see the top of, top of that tree being reflected and depending on where they are and what angle they're looking at that glass, they might think it's a, a suitable place to go and find some food or find some, some shelter. Reflections can be very real to birds. And if you look at the end of this glass walkway, I mean, you don't, you can't blame them. Besides the little breaks in the pain, panes of glass, it, it looks like, you know, another forest, another grassland over there. And again, birds don't understand glass as a barrier for transparent glass. This photo is from New York City, and you can imagine that might be the most lush green landscape that a bird might find for blocks or even more in New York City or, or other large cities. So if a bird were drawn in by nocturnal lighting and confused and landed right here, and then first light comes and they see all that greenery, of course they're going to go to try to hide in there and find some food. So uh, with that transparent kind of unperceivable glass there, uh, birds can struggle in those situations. One thing I'd like to point out, it's, it's kind of difficult when we're thinking about reducing the threat of these, of these surfaces, is the same window can be problematic or not so bad throughout the day. So on the far left, when you can, the sun's hitting that window, you can see they're shelving, they see some plants, a bird might not try to fly into that area. But later on in the day, when it's more reflective because of the glare of the sun, you can see the tree, uh, the bird might try to fly through that area and accidentally hit the window. So 
it's very dependent on what's being reflected, what time of day, the glazing on the glass. Um, it's, it's a tough thing to think about, especially if you're doing after the fact. One thing I'm gonna talk about is if you plan a new construction, especially more of a commercial building, but it goes for homes as well. If you think about these issues from the beginning, they're very uh, easy or reasonable to, to work out. If you're trying to retrofit, that's where it gets a little bit more tricky. So what are some of these building hazards? How are we learning more about this issue? How's it being tested? Uh, let me go into some of this information that we have. So first, let's talk about the hazard of lighting. So again, I mentioned the lights at night can attract and disorient birds. And there's no stronger example of this than the Tribute and Lights uh, in New York City at the site of the 9-11, uh, you know, Twin Towers. And so the lights come on in September um, to remember those that we lost. Unfortunately for birds, September, mid-September happens to be when many, many birds are flying over the New York area. And so what happens is this phenomenon here in this, in this video. I apologize if that was loud in your end. What you're looking at is you're looking from the bottom of the lights going up and all those little white specks, those aren't moths or mosquitoes, those are birds. And volunteers from New York City Audubon, New York Audubon, Cornell Ornithology, all these partners are working to kind of to try to quantify and document what's happening here at the Tribute and Lights. Now, this is a very bright, bright light source that's probably not matched anywhere or very few places in our country. But look at the number of birds that you can just see in the first, you know, couple hundred feet of this beam that goes up for who knows how, how high. And they've produced some, some interesting science and published their work here. And here's from one night in 2015. So the left image is at 10, 12 p.m. On, the, on September 11th of, the 15, of 2015, excuse me. The lights are off. There are 500 birds within a half kilometer of the space. Then after the lights have been on for 20 minutes, there's almost 16,000 birds in that same geographic area. You can see how hot that red area is around the lights very clear that they are being drawn into that area. Now, the partners who've worked on this in New York City, they actually have got the lights to get cut off. So if they can count, I believe it's a thousand birds at one time, they will turn off the, the lights. The birds pretty quickly disperse. They wait a while, they'll turn the lights back on and they'll do that off and on a couple of times if it happens to be a, a big night of bird movement. Um, so this is just a, an illustration or example of of the power of nocturnal light, even though this might be, again, an extreme case. However, there's just more and more light pollution going on. This is the Houston metro area, a spot that many birds migrating across the Gulf of Mexico might encounter, either as the first place they make landfall in the spring or one of the last places they, they see land before they head down to, you know, Yucatan or parts of Central America. And the Houston metro area is now larger than the state of New Jersey. And as you can tell here, it's pretty bright like many places uh, of this size. And so that collective glow of our urban lighting is proving more and more problematic for birds and even at not so special buildings like this one. So this is not the Tribute and Lights. This is a relatively boring office building on the outskirts of Galveston. Nothing special here. That building could be anywhere across the state of Georgia. Um, and on one night, having to do with the fog and the way that the, the building is spotlit, and again, probably because it's down on the Gulf Coast, you have all these birds migrating over. Almost 500 birds died at that building on May 3rd of 2017. And you can see, you know, all the hooded warblers and black and white warblers and oven birds and red starts, black burning warblers, amazing, colorful, you know, springtime jewels that have, some of them just migrated hundreds or thousands of miles from, you know, northern South America or parts of Nicaragua and just to hit that building after flying across the Gulf of Mexico. So it's, um, it's unfortunate and it's sad, and, um, but again, it just shows you it doesn't have to be this crazy beam of light for lighting to be an issue for our migrants. Now, when we're talking about glass, in general, more glass equals more collisions. Um, sometimes it has to do with the glazing and how reflective or how transparent, but when there's more glass, there tends to be more collisions. One thing that's always kind of frustrating um, is green buildings, buildings that often use a lot of glass and are trying to be more eco-friendly or, or even LEED certified, and I'll talk more about LEED in a little bit, they can be problematic because they, they can uh, use a lot of glass. 
one thing you might be thinking about, or, or I've, a question I've received a lot is, do birds in the fall hit the north side of buildings in the spring? Do they hit the south side? Or, you know, does cardinal direction matter? And the answer is no, not really. It's much more important or, or more valuable to think about the, the landscaping and the layout of the space itself. So if you have a very reflective surface on the east side, or if the west side is facing a forest, um, that's more when you're gonna, where you're going to find those birds. The birds migrate at night, they're going to land in the morning, they're going to move around their space, they're going to go where the habitat or food is, and then depending on where the, the facade is that has a lot of glass, that's where you're going to likely find the birds. And so what are some of these, these parts of buildings that can be problematic? So I mentioned glass corners. It doesn't seem like it, but a bird might try to fly right through these, these semi, I guess they're not parallel windows, but these matched up pieces of transparent glass. A bird might try to just cut through that corner. Channeling is a bit unfortunate. There's a piece of glass kind of further ahead that you might not be able to make out. Um, the bird is going to unintentionally kind of be funneled or channeled down this walkway because of the way the vegetation is laid out and because of the pathway. And so it's accidentally driving birds towards um, that piece of glass. Green roofs are fantastic and, and I'm a big fan of them and we should have more of them, but we do have to be cautious of adjacent glass, as you can see in that kind of larger atrium area there. Uh, birds are going to use that green roof and then uh, any glass that's adjacent to it could be an issue uh, for birds. Planted courtyards um, are, are definitely an issue. If a bird were to get down in there to try to you know, they're not an issue, they're, they're an area where there could be an increased risk of collisions. I'm not anti-courtyard or anti-atria, but there's things we need to do to make them more bird safe. And in general, lower windows are typically worse in regards to collisions. And that makes sense if you think about the big driver being reflections of habitat, reflections of trees, reflections of bushes. Birds will and occasionally do hit the 40th floor of a window or of a building that's just reflecting sky, but it's much more likely they're going to be down in the vegetation and then see the reflections and have issues there. And it's not just buildings, it's any sort of, you know, random piece of, of glass that's been put up in our, our environment. You know, we share spaces with birds. They're not somewhere else, as most of you probably know. You look out back or you go to your city park, birds are everywhere. And so a, a really transparent bus stop or some reflective glass along the side of the freeway that's meant to be a noise barrier or any sort of glass as a railing can be a threat uh, to birds in regards to collisions. Either it can be so transparent the birds don't pick it up or so reflective they confuse it for a green space. One thing we get questions about at Audubon all the time and something that's related, so I like to point it out, is when birds are attacking their own reflection. So here we're seeing a summer tanager and it's going after its reflection in the car here. This photo was almost certainly taken in springtime. Uh, this is when most of this, most of this happens, late spring into summer. Testosterone levels are up and that bird is attacking its reflection because it thinks it's an intruding male. So it illustrates the point that birds have a hard time with reflections. Um, but the difference between this and when a bird hits a building that bird is expecting to make contact with what it thinks is a second bird, its reflection. So it's easing up, it's putting its feet out, it's, it's bracing for some contact. Um, the issue with collisions from reflection is birds don't move like that slowly and, and kind of stalling when they're moving through space, when they're foraging, when they're trying to avoid a Cooper's hawk like this. And especially if the tree or the bush still looks five, 10, 50, 100 feet away in the reflection. They're going at full speed. And so both cases um, show how birds struggle with glass, but this one is uh, the, the attacking its own reflection is different because they're ready for impact when they're not uh, in this situation. Just like you kind of walking with your head down, looking at your cell phone, you're not expecting there to be something, and then you run into a street sign or a railing or something silly like that. Excuse me. So thinking about ways we can make our surfaces, our glass safer for birds, it's really important to understand the life history of, of our songbirds and our, our migrant species in general. 
Um, most of these birds are song birds, even though any migratory species can hit windows. And actually any bird at any time could hit. It's just more frequently encountered during spring and fall migration. Most of these birds are small. They're very good at maneuvering tight spaces. You know, if you ever try to watch a, a wren, you know, a sedge wren or a winter wren or a small warbler, they can really move through those dense bushes or grass tussocks. And they have a very good sense of their shape and size. And so with that in mind, and with some research that's been done, I'll show you how that was done. We've come up with something called the two by four rule. And pretty much the two by four rule says that if you want to make a window or a piece of glass or a surface less of a threat to birds, you need to have some sort of visual cue every two inches vertically or every four inches horizontally. And you can kind of see with this chickadee as an example that they, despite being very good at maneuvering tight spaces and knowing their dimensions, <clears throat> that's about the cutoff. Most songbirds are not going to try to squeeze through areas of that size. Now, we are starting to suggest maybe a two by two rule, especially when it comes to hummingbirds, because a hummingbird might be able to squeeze through a four inch gap. I'll talk more about that, but the two by four rule has kind of been the guidelines, the, the best practices um, when we're thinking about making a surface better for our bird life. And so how are we taking that data? A, a how do we get it? And B, what are we doing with it now that we have that four by two or two by rule uh, information with us. And here's an example of this barn swallow showing you how amazingly you can fit through a tight space flying through that gap in a wall. So a lot of this work has been done at the Powder Mill Research Station, which is outside of Pittsburgh. Um, this is a flight tunnel uh, where they are testing various products to see how effective they are at deterring collisions. And so at this place, they're, they're doing lots of bird research here. They have a banding station. They catch birds. And then before they let them go uh, on their way, they, they have them fly down this flight tunnel. Um, there's a similar tunnel um, in Austria, and there have been some other field-based um, collision research done uh, by Dr. Daniel Klim and others trying to test out different products. But this is the one I want to uh, highlight today. And the way it works is you, they catch the bird, they, they band it and take whatever measurements they might be taking. They let it go in this dark tunnel so that the birds fly towards the light. <clears throat> and you can see in the middle picture, there's two pieces of glass. One is just a completely normal, untreated pain. And the one you can see here has some uh, horizontal striping on it. There are others that, you know, you can test out vertical striping or certain dots or spaces or, or whatever you want to do to test how effective it is. And just so you, you don't worry, there is a mist net right before the glass. So the birds are not being sacrificed here. They're caught once more in the net, then they're let go, uh, can continue their life uh, as, as a happy little song. And so what this tunnel test allows is to see how often are birds avoiding the treated pane of glass and going towards the untreated pane. So in other words, you can measure the uh, avoidance that the birds are showing towards one pane of glass. And this is just some, some basic results of some tests of the, Austri uh, the Austrian site and powder mill. Uh, we're looking at the years and the pattern. So the pattern has to do with the spacing. Uh, 10 centimeters horizontal, 10 centimeters vertical in the years of 4, 5, 6, 10, 11. The number of flights, the number of times they let a bird down the flight, and then percentage of those flights, the birds went to the untreated pane of glass, again, presumably avoiding the treated one. And so you can see when you have that tighter uh, vertical spacing, um, the four inches more or less, it goes from the 78%, which again, that was four inches horizontally, move it vertically, those vertical stripes, and it's almost, you know, 15% more effective at moving birds away uh, from that surface. So this is some of the data that is uh, supporting the products that are now available to reduce or in some cases eliminate bird building collisions. One thing to think about with these, these steps to make windows safer, um, the applications need to be contrasty. Uh, we talked earlier how us humans have a little bit better perception of contrast than birds. And so pretty much all the, all the materials or all the steps we're going to talk about making windows safe, they need to be on the outside. If you have them on the inside of a two-pane window, oftentimes the, the reflection is going to drown out that signal. And, and again, contrast is really important. So you can look at these two photos. The one in the middle, you can see the black tape. 
there's some on the outside, a strip, and then a strip on the inside. And the strip outside, inside, outside. And you can see it doesn't quite, it isn't as, doesn't have as much contrast as we see in the white uh, paint to the right. And you can see the difference between the white on the outside versus the white on the inside. Now, one thing I will mention here is the left windows here just have an old school bug screen. Those are great. Those really help birds. So if you have those on your home windows, that's wonderful. It cuts down on the reflection, and if a bird were to hit, hit it, they would probably bounce off and not be harmed. Um, but this idea of contrast and having things on the outside of your glass is really important to think about when we want to make our buildings better for, for wildlife. I get questions a lot about internal blinds or shades. There might be some situations where um, it's better than nothing, that's for sure, but it's not um, a real solution. So you can see in both these photos, or all three of them, excuse me, with closed blinds or with shades or with even partially open blinds, that does have a pattern effect, which is often effective for birds. The reflection of the tree is still drowning out any sort of message or signal from the internal blinds. So again, it really is important to do things to the outside to reduce that reflection. So we have this information, we've, we've, and we, the collective we, the ornithological community, the birding community, uh, we've been doing this, this research. We're, we're having a better understanding of the numbers of birds harmed. Uh, how are we going to apply uh, what's being learned? And so one thing, I won't bore you too much with some of these big things, but it's important to know there are more and more cities and states that are um, doing legislation or ordinances or building guidelines. Um, and I'll talk more about this, but the upper list there, these are places where there already are ordinances or, or guidelines for bird safe buildings, bird friendly buildings. So, you know, many California cities, uh, parts of Cook County, Illinois, where Chicago is, uh, a lot in Canada. I have to admit, uh, Canada is doing a much better job than we are here in the States in regards to birds and buildings. And then there are many more that are being uh, worked on currently that are in progress uh, down here in the States and, and a big one in Canada, which I'll talk about in a moment. One thing that's really exciting is there is a Federal Bird Safe Buildings Act. Um, it's a bipartisan effort. Um, it, it was put into the House by Quigley and Griffith and then the Senate by Booker. And it requires all new federal buildings to incorporate bird-friendly design features. So 90% of the bottom four floors have to be treated to a certain percentage to make them less of a threat to birds. And then 60% of the upper floors, above 40 feet. And, and you also have to think about courtyards, atria, and the lighting that the building has. But some really exciting stuff, which I was happy to update since the last time I gave this presentation. Um, this actually passed in the House this summer. Um, so it's now sent over to the Senate and we will see what happens. But the first big hurdle uh, was reached. I mentioned LEED. Uh, you might know what LEED buildings are. There are certain sustainability and eco-friendly standards that certain buildings have. You can get certified as you know, silver, gold, or platinum. There actually is a credit you can get for a LEED bird-friendly building. And a lot of these ordinances have been built off of these LEED credits. So on the left, you can see the LEED pilot credit. You have to have the bottom three floors treated to a certain extent and then the upper floors to a lesser extent. And just for example, the San Francisco Bird Safe Standards have been modeled off of that, but, but tweaked in various ways. And these are the details of that, of that one point uh, lead credit 55. Again, this is real inside baseball here, but there's just, you know, certain things you have to do to calculate the threat of a building. There has to be monitoring. Um, and you, you know, if you want to get this credit, if you want to be eco-friendly, sustainable and bird friendly, uh, you should look at getting this credit. So if you happen to be an architect out there or know someone who is or a building manager, um, make sure you share this information with them. <clears throat> now, I mentioned there were a couple new and exciting legislation or pieces of ordinance that were passing. One is uh, across Canada, they are developing a new national building design standards for birds. A lot of this was done by the work of FLAP, uh, which is now Bird Safe Canada. There's also a group in Ontario doing great stuff. Um, so Canada is going to have a whole national standard for all new buildings that take into consideration bird safety uh, in, in regards to design features and glass and all sorts of exciting stuff. And then uh, stateside here, New York City Audubon passed the most aggressive legislation we have here in the U.S. Um, so 90 percent 
of the exterior of all new construction in New York City or all major renovations, uh, the bottom 75 feet have to be treated at that 90% mark. Um, so the sp specifics are still being worked out, but this is really exciting news and something that other cities are already using as a guideline for their own legislation, their own ordinances. Because there are many ways we can have bird safe buildings um, that are attractive and, and still perfect for us humans, which I'm gonna talk about right now. Uh, but this is really exciting news from New York City that is still being ironed out all the final details. So what is a bird friendly building? I'm talking about you gotta treat the bottom 40 feet and you know 15% of the upper 90%. So again, I know it's very technical, but what does this look like when it's all said and done? Do bird-friendly buildings have to be ugly? Can they not have any glass? Do we need to build concrete you know, blocks around our cities? The answer is absolutely not. We just have to put a little more thought into it than we are uh, right now. Glass-heavy buildings can be bird-friendly, again, as long as there is some signaling to the birds that this might not be a true habitat that you think you're flying to. This reflection is not quite what you think. So, <clears throat> example, this Anchorage Museum has lots of glass, but because of those vertical um, signals there, it's less likely to have collisions uh, because of those markings. If you want to design a bird-friendly building, um, you can kind of look at it in a few different ways. You can use less glass, which is kind of obvious, but not everyone's going to want to go that route. You can reduce the exposure of the glass that you have in your building or you can incorporate some sort of signal into the glass itself. And I'm going to show you examples of all three of those. One thing that's really exciting, um, you know, a way that I kind of educate people about this and something to think about, again, if you are in any way working in the, in the built environment, these design features often overlap with solar shading, glare control. Uh, you can make it a really, you know, sharp looking aesthetic to your building. So it's not just a generic glass box out in the suburbs. Uh, there are uh, ways it can work in with security and thermal control, energy efficiency. So you don't have to just do a bird-friendly building. You can do a bird-friendly building that looks good and it's also sustainable and it's saving you money on your energy bill. So there's lots of ways that these things can all work um, in harmony. So this is kind of a bad example. And if you've been a birder for a while, you might have heard about this years ago. This is the U.S. Bank Stadium up in Minneapolis, the Vikings football stadium. And when the plans came out <clears throat> that they wanted to build this glass um, stadium that kind of was reminiscent of a Viking ship, which is the football team up there, the local Audubon groups and, and others said, hey, we're right on the river. This is a major flyaway for our migrants and you're gonna get a lot of collisions. And at that point, they were kind of late getting this word to the people. Um, it was gonna cost a million dollars to change the glass to the bird safe glass. That's a big price tag. Um, however, it was a over $1 billion building. Um, so in comparison, pretty small, um, but the building decided not to go uh, for the different class. They built it as they planned and we're finding, or they're finding lots of dead birds up there. Um, and the people who own the stadium have now funded, this is maybe a year or two ago, a $300,000 project to determine the scale of the issue that's funded a couple graduate students and, and others. So. They're already a third of the way paying what they could have just nipped in the bud at the beginning. Um, but it's kind of a, a, a bad example. But the good thing is it led to these fantastic examples that are in the same region. <clears throat> so the Minnesota Loons are a newer soccer team, and they have one of the first uh, bird-friendly uh, uh, stadiums um, that they have there. And then even more impressive is the Milwaukee Bucks. They were the first LEED 55 bird-friendly certified building um, in Milwaukee. And, They've done fantastic stuff with their glass and with their lighting. Even their landscaping is native. And I happened to be up there last summer and saw it in person. You wouldn't even know. If, if you hadn't heard of this talk or you had no idea what bird safe glass looked like, it looks like a normal arena. It's big. It's got lots of glass. But the glass, like in the middle from this photo, you can even tell there's a very small array of dots, which, again, drowns out that, that reflection enough to really reduce its threat. Windows on the right, you can see a vertical pinstripe, which again, is gonna help the birds. They reduce the lighting during the evening, especially on non-game nights. And they do a lot of other very smart and easy steps uh, to make it safer for birds. So this isn't something that's so extreme. You can't have the types of buildings we're used to or that we enjoy. It's relatively minor changes. And again, if you think about them from the beginning and plan for them, the costs are minimal. That $1 million on the US Bank Stadium 
um, is not the norm for every, every structure. So what is this pilot credit 55 uh, that the LEED certification has? What does that look like? The answer, it can look like a whole bunch of different things. So these are all examples of buildings that have that pilot credit. Some are a bit more exciting, like the Tracy Aviary in Salt Lake City in the upper left. It's got that exterior metal screening that's going to break up the glass. But I mean, these buildings on the right, you know, they're completely average and, and unspectacular. And you wouldn't know anything about them being safer for birds or going that extra step to reduce the threat. So it doesn't have to be anything extreme uh, to help birds if you go through this credit. So I mentioned one way was reducing the amount of glass. Uh, one, another way is reducing the exposure. So these are a bit more fun and funky, um, but these are buildings that have glass, but have some sort of external screening, external shutters, things that are movable to allow in that natural light that we all love so much, but not have it permanently be there and be an issue for birds. Some of these are across Europe, but you know, a good example on the bottom left are the New York Times I'm sure they, they put up that metal screen. They were not thinking about birds. They, they like the aesthetic, but it does address both the way it looks and uh, unintentionally, it helps birds. So it's kind of a cool example. Now there are more and more glass products that are actually deemed bird friendly. And I'm gonna show you a couple more, um, but these buildings all actually built with glass that because of some feature of the glass, they're not gonna be as dangerous to birds. They have those markings, they have asset etching, they're opaque in some way, they have those visual cues to uh, not be as confusing to birds. One fantastic example that we like to point out here, like in the collision world, is the Javits Center in New York City. So it's a convention center, it's a huge building, it's very glass heavy as you can see, and when New York City Audubon volunteers were monitoring this space, they were finding more birds here than any other building they were monitoring. But the building did a large renovation. They put it on a green roof that's now having nesting herring gulls and other exciting bird life. But they also put in this glass with this very small dot array and they've had a 90% decrease um, in the number of birds that have been colliding with their building. So again, very small things you can do. I mean, this was a big thing. They swapped out all their glass. But if you were planning from the beginning, it's, it's a relatively small step. And these are examples of buildings with just less glass. This is not gonna work for everyone's aesthetic, um, but reducing glass tends to help birds. Now I mentioned way back when at the beginning that birds or many of them can see in the UV spectrum. So more and more products are becoming available that actually have UV patterns embedded in the glass. And again, the UV is is pretty much invisible or barely perceptible to us humans. And so these are ideal because they can signal to the birds that they're not safe, but they can be completely transparent uh, to us humans. And you can see that in the Glass Pro, Bird Safe Glass on the right, uh, those, those thick vertical stripes that come up uh, when exposed to UV light. My screen's flashing a little bit. I hope that's not coming through on your end. If it is, I, I apologize. And hopefully it's a temporary uh, issue. So we've been talking about all this, these big buildings and how you can build them safer and these huge numbers. And you're probably thinking um, that it's mainly high rise, big skyscrapers that are killing lots of birds. And in reality, they kill a lot per building, but there aren't that many across our landscape. You know, how many 50 story buildings are there in our country compared to the number of homes or those low rise business parks that are very reflective and maybe still closer to, to good habitat. And so only a couple, you know, two, three percent of all these collisions are thought to occur at high rises. Over 40 percent in homes and over 50 percent are these, you know, two, three, four, five story buildings that tend to have a lot of glass and reflect a lot of habitat. So if you have a building, especially one of these low rise buildings, and you want to fix it, it's already up. Uh, you can't follow legislation. You can't use those bird safe glass or the UV glass. What can you do? Well, there are many products, including films, you can look into. And so on the left, upper left photo, that's Kaleidoscape. That's kind of a extreme case where they're putting that complete white coverage, that white film on the outside. Few people are going to want to go that route, but it does cut down on the amount of light coming in and it does provide security. Um, and it's 100, almost 100% safe for birds. Um, that being said, you can also take Kaleidoscape and get something like in the bottom left, that dot pattern. There's a similar product, Feather Friendly, which is fantastic, that also has that dot pattern. 
And you can look at these vertical stripes <clears throat> that are very, you know, discreet once they're up, once they're up. And then even the bottom right, I believe that's from Swarthmore College where their music department took that idea of the vertical lines and put music uh, bars with birds on it. So again, as long as you're abiding by that two by two rule or two by four rule, it's highly effective for birds. Um, you can't put up that black falcon silhouette that you used to see all over the place and expect it to reduce many collisions. It's gonna work in the immediate area around that silhouette, around that window cling. Uh, and the thought was that maybe small songbirds would be afraid of that falcon cut out, and maybe they are a little bit, but the rest of the window is still a major threat uh, to birds. One thing you can do again for these medium-sized buildings and also for your home uh, are these acopian bird savers. They're, they're like a zen curtain. They dangle on the outside and, and they're, they're pretty sharp. I've only seen them once in person up in Philadelphia, um, but if you don't want to put something on the glass itself, it's a great idea. You can do it yourself, even on the Ecopian website, they kind of tell you how to do it for cheap. You just dangle some parachute cord or, or other cables, which you can buy off Amazon for pennies. And as long as you're spacing them every two inches apart or every four inches at the most, you're gonna have a real reduction up to the number of birds that might be hitting your windows. So we kind of know what's going on and we know ways we can build better buildings or retrofit some of this work, but What's the monitoring been like across the country and, and how is it continuing to occur? So there's lots of monitoring and research efforts from well-established um, volunteer programs. Liz, I see you raise your hand. If you just wanna throw your question up in the chat box or send me the question and answer, I will be happy to answer it for you. Um, but Toronto, Chicago, New York, uh, many other cities have been looking at this effort locally, how many birds and what buildings and what can be done. This is a major part of the National Audubon Society's strategic plan. Uh, the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center has done great work with this. Scott Loss, Dan Klim, and Steve Hager are all academics who have studied this issue. And Scott Loss is in Oklahoma, at Oklahoma State, and he's the one who published the great paper that gave us the most up-to-date uh, numbers on birds that are colliding with buildings. So they've all done their great work in their own little section of this issue. And then the American Bird Conservancy is really the leader on this, um, in my opinion. They've done great work with legislation. They have a couple of great experts on their team. and Everyone's kind of working in concert to try to get this issue taken care of. But here in Atlanta, there, there hasn't been much. And outside of Atlanta, I don't know, I know very little in Georgia at all. There's been some work done in Athens by Richard Hall and others uh, a little bit. <clears throat> but prior to my arrival in 2015, all I could find was a, a, a small project that Tim Kai is a Georgia DNR biologist, did with a master's student back in 05, where they looked at a subset of buildings over one fall migratory period, and, and they found almost 500 birds um, using volunteers. And when I started in 2015, uh, we knew this was something we wanted to tackle. And so I didn't know Atlanta. I just moved here. I kind of poked around Buckhead a little bit in downtown and very easily and quickly found birds all over the place. And so it was clear that this was something we wanted to look into further and figure out how we could monitor here in, in, in Atlanta. And so that's when we created Project Safe Flight Atlanta, which is now turning into Project Safe Flight Georgia. So again, if you are outside of Atlanta, this is not just an Atlanta thing anymore. We want your help, uh, no matter where you are, whether you're in a big city or not. So uh, please keep listening. Um, our original goal was to monitor parts of Metro Atlanta, determine the extent of the problem locally, and then develop a lights out program to reduce our lighting and, and find ways to make our city safer. So to do this, we monitor. We have volunteers go out in spring and fall, um, mid-March to the end of May, and then right now, mid-August, birds are already moving through mid-November. We walk permanent, consistent routes in Buckhead and downtown Georgia Tech. And then we also look at a few standalone buildings, residences, and collect any data on incidental findings. And again, we want this information for the entire state. If you are a volunteer who sticks around or, or is uh, consistently going out with us, we have an app that we have access to called Collector. And through this app, we build routes, which are the blue dash lines on the far left. We walk those routes and we can drop a pin, these little red markings, whenever you find a bird. And you can do the exact location. So that way we're learning of the, the certain facades that are more dangerous than others and certain buildings that are worse than others. We can look at time of year when certain species are migrating through. 
Um, so we can pick up a lot of cool site specific data from this app that pen and paper wouldn't work for us. And it gives us these, you know, unique maps that you see on the right. And, and so far in the five years we've been out, we did not monitor this past spring because of COVID. Um, we have found over 1700 individual birds of 112 different species. We've been able to educate and, and advocate for these birds a lot. We've saved many injured birds. We would have saved more if we need, if we had more volunteers. So that's my first, <laughs> first of many pleas to you to, to help us out. Um, but we're finding lots of birds. You can kind of see certain buildings tend to get more collisions than others for many reasons. Uh, more glass, more reflection, more trees, things that I've already talked about. These are our top 10 most common birds in order. People are very saddened, rightfully so, to see that the ruby-throated hummingbird is by far the most common bird that we see. If you pay attention to Georgia Audubon programs, maybe you've been lucky enough to see our ambassador hummingbird, Sibley. Um, he is an, uh, a hummingbird that our education director takes care of who's unable to fly because it ran into a window and is permanently injured. Um, but you'll see Tennessee warbler. <clears throat> That's a hard bird for many bird watchers to find, but come October, we, we find a lot of them. Waxwings and robins are very common. When, whenever a berry or fruit producing tree is reflected, we can find a lot of them. And with waxwings, they, they flock so tightly. Uh, unfortunately, if we find one, we often find many. Um, and you'll see many other, again, mainly migrants with thrushes, vireos, grosbeaks, and even a woodpecker, uh, the saps up there. Oh, that's interesting. So uh, my friend Jesse, who's over in Birmingham, says that the most common bird they find are oven birds. And we do find a lot of them, but they're number one over there and they're not quite as high here. So it is interesting to think about the species that are migrating through and, and when and where and, and the geography, you know, who knows, maybe the mountains have an effect on that. So that's pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> some interesting things we found, we have found 29 different warbler species, uh, including the golden winged warbler. Luckily, we haven't had any ceruleans. Uh, one of our board members did actually have a cerulean at her cabin up in North Carolina just last week. Uh, but here in Atlanta, we haven't found that yet. Common nighthawk, a couple of secretive marsh birds, Sora, Virginia rail, a bobolink and a dick thistle, both on, both on Georgia Tech's campus, very far from the grassland habitat that they normally prefer. Uh, a couple years ago, we had a nice eruption of red-breasted nuthatches, and that meant a lot of collisions. And then uh, a zebra finch, and if you know a zebra finch, that bird was <clears throat> either a pet or a research bird that got loose, but was quite an interesting find uh, for Buckhead. Luckily, it's not all bad news, especially with all the great volunteers we have. We do find birds that are alive and we work with many rehabbers to try to help them and, and heal them if possible. Um, my favorite story is that one on the far left, that's a grasshopper sparrow that I found in a revolving door before sunrise in downtown Atlanta. Um, so if I would have been a little bit later and someone would have come to work and turned that door, it might have been um, unfortunate for that bird. But that's again a, a really interesting bird, bird that's normally out in agricultural areas or, or grasslands. It was right in the middle of town. So it's not all sad news, which is great. So I mentioned one of the things that we did was create a lights out program. This was modeled off of other cities like Chicago. Chicago, here you can see Chicago where they get some of the top larger buildings to reduce their decorative light up top. We're trying to get commercial properties and homeowners. Um, so please consider signing your home up to reduce any lighting that you can. Anything that's not necessary, use motion sensors, use timers. Um, it's good for your energy bill, um, it's good for the planet, and it's good for birds that are migrating over. This is from a study, um, uh, I guess just last year, where cities were ranked based off of the likelihood that their nocturnal light was gonna have a negative impact on birds. So look at the size of the city, how bright it was, um, and how many birds were flying over that area. And looking at Atlanta specifically, they were the ninth most dangerous city in spring and fourth during fall, according to these metrics, or this combined variable. So um, here in, in Georgia, especially in Atlanta, you know, we have some issues. One thing that's kind of cool that I always like to talk about is the uh, use of nocturnal flight calls. So many of our, our migrating songbirds will call at night, and there are studies showing that these birds will call more when they're flying over brighter areas. We don't know whether it's confusion or attraction, but the species that are more vocal during migration tend to <clears throat> become what we call super colliders. 
they're more likely to, to collide with structures, maybe because they're calling in their species mates into these areas where they're going to collide. And before I learned about this, um, I was surprised that we didn't find more blue gray gnat catchers because they're such a common bird in our area. Um, but they're not thought to do these nocturnal flight calls. What's also interesting is I'm talking about all this nocturnal flight and how much of an issue it is, but ruby-throated hummingbirds tend to fly at day, if I'm not mistaken, and that's our most common bird. So um, it's very interesting. <clears throat> One thing that we're hoping to do is to um, take this information. Sorry, I'm reading a question here from Katrina. Do I have information on the artificial light harm during migration study? I can probably share that with you. I'm going to share my contact info in a minute, uh, Katrina. If you will follow up with me, uh, I will be happy to send you the, the papers that I have and, and the references. So um, that probably would be the best way for me to do that for you. Um, this is using bird migration forecasting tools um, and potentially developing a lights out alert based on a, a peak of migration or a lot of birds moving over your area. Ideally, we would get buildings to reduce their lighting all the time, especially during migration. But maybe if a building can't be convinced to turn off their lights or reduce their lights for three or six months a year, maybe they will for a couple of nights. So um, this is still kind of being worked out. And Kyle Horton is a guy who's doing a lot of great work out of Colorado State uh, on, this, on this front. So I mentioned retrofitting in films. We've been lucky enough here in Atlanta to retrofit a good number of buildings over the past two and a half, three years. This is a Chattahoochee Nature Center, which was our first project. This is funded by a grant from the Disney Conservation Fund. And we're putting up that kaleidoscape film in a dot pattern, space four inches apart. And you can see how it's done pretty easy here. And it looks pretty sharp. It's white on the outside, it has that contrast. On the inside, it's dark, so it's less noticeable for people looking out of their windows. And it's highly effective for reducing collisions. <clears throat> this is the Newman Wetland Center down in Clayton County. It's that same kaleidoscape pro uh, product, but we've printed photos on it, uh, photos that were taken on the property. Um, so again, it, it eliminates that reflect reflective surface and it allows them to show off the bounty of their green space down there. And it is an education center, so it educates people about the wildlife and uh, collisions. This is the Sawney Mountain Visitor Center up in Forsyth County, north of Atlanta. And they did a combination of multiple things. They did uh, the dots on some windows. They did a pale or a gray tint, as you can see on the far right. They did some text and some amazing photos and graphics. And in the middle there, the, the bottom piece of glass has been treated. So that's where it says stewardship. But the top one has nothing. And this is from the inside looking out. And you can see it's not drastic. You're still getting a lot of natural light. You're still having a great view. Um, so don't be scared off by these products. <clears throat> and this is the South Face Institute. We just did this two weeks ago. This is our, our most recent um, project. And I wanted to show this, A, because I'm excited about it, and B, you can't tell anything is going on in that picture on the right. So it's not going to ruin the aesthetic of your building. Uh, you can still look just as you like. And this was our first building with that two by two spacing with the updated recommendations. <coughs> Excuse me again. And we just started to dip our toe with some hard work on new construction. So the Candida Building of Innovative Sustainable Design on Georgia Tech's campus is the first building that we've been a part of here in Atlanta or in Georgia that I know of that utilize that bird friendly glass. So they did that similar dot array um, that we saw from the Javits Center. And so if you do live in Atlanta or if you have a kid or family member at Georgia Tech, make sure to check it out next time you're around campus and you can <laughs> safely do so um, and go, go look at this. And again, once you get a couple feet away, um, you don't notice it. It's not, not an ugly thing to do what's right for birds. So what can you do uh, to help birds and to help us at Georgia Audubon? We always need help monitoring. Uh, you can join us for some formal routes, which I'm going to talk about here in just a moment. Um, you can survey your office. You can also report any sort of incidental finding you can. Even if you don't want to commit to volunteering, just let us know if you find something. I'm going to tell you on the next slide how to do that. Now that you know that a billion birds potentially are dying each year, you got to tell people. You got to let them know when they hear that thud at their bay window that they can do something about it very easily and that they can turn off their lights. Um, we always need people helping us with injured birds, you know, being a taxi. Um, and we have a, a great sanctuary program, which you should think about if you're a gardener or have a good green space. Think about the steps you can take to make your yard safer. And, and with that comes a pledge uh, to try to do what you can about reducing collisions. 
if you cannot volunteer um, or if you um, just are out and about or not in Atlanta, uh, we have a website through our partnership with uh, New York City Audubon called DBIRD. So it's dbird.org slash ATL. And it's kind of our catch all for incidental findings. So if you happen to come across a bird that's dead or injured or obviously ran into a window, you can report your sighting here. And pretty much all you have to do is type in the address where you found the bird, enter a couple questions. If you happen to know if it's a male or a female, if you happen to know the species, that's all great. It's not vital. Just upload a photo and I can probably figure it out. Um, but dbird.org slash ATL, it still has our old Atlanta Audubon branding. We're going to try to update that. But this is a great resource if you would like to report any bird you come across. Um, someone just asked what was the brand of the dot pattern that we used. There are two. One is Feather Friendly. It's based out of Canada. And they partner with 3M, a 3M product, and they will, uh, they have a do-it-yourself home kit that's great if you have, you know, one or two problematic windows at home. If you happen to do something for the bigger building, they can give you whole sheets of film to treat it. The other one is called Collide Escape, C-O-L-L-I-D-E-S-C-A, <laughs> I got confused, Escape, E-S-C-A-P-E, excuse me. Um, those are both great films. There are others. If you go to our website or the American Bird Conservancy, you can learn more. Um, but Feather Friendly and Kaleidoscape are both great products. So again, this is D-Bird. If you, if you can't volunteer with us but just want to report a sighting, I do encourage you to check it out. And at home, you can put up the films, but you can also put up those screens, external shutters, hang those cords like here in the middle. The American Bird Conservancy uh, used to or still does sell this tape. I know they're working on getting it distributed again if it's not available on their site. And it comes in a roll, it's $10. Just do that two or four inch spacing and it's great. Um, <clears throat> or if you have kids or grandkids or if you're uh, artistic or don't mind, put some you know, squiggly temporary paint or fake snow or soap on your windows for a couple months of the year and it might help. And you probably know you might only have one or two windows where most of your collisions occur. So. We'd love for you to treat all of them, but if you really just have one area that's, that's worse than others, um, go at it and there are many different ways you can address it. So an overview here, um, if you didn't know, collisions are a big problem. Third leading cause of bird death in our country. It's mainly during migration, but it absolutely happens year round. And during the summer months, we often find a lot of young birds that, that have hit buildings. Um, it's getting easier to, to get these products out there and to, um, get people thinking about birds when they're building uh, buildings, but that's where ordinances are really crucial. And just educating people. So many people don't know. They might know the one or two windows or birds that hits their house throughout the year, but they don't understand the scale of the problem. And there are ways you can truly help that don't require too much work. So this is kind of a break point. I would love for you all to stay with me. Um, but from here on out, I'm gonna talk about how you can become a more active volunteer or how you can report birds for our Project Safe Flight program. So I encourage you all to stay on, but um, this is more about the nuts and bolts, how we're actually doing things and a few tips on how we're gonna try to do them this fall uh, with everything that's going on. So I don't want you to leave. I'll just mention that um, in case you're curious or in case you need to go watch your favorite TV show before it gets too late. Um, so yes, Project Safe Flight Atlanta, um, is was our program again we're making that project safe flight georgia so if you are tuning in from anywhere in our great state <laughs> um i want your help so please pay attention uh, this is a tennessee warbler on the right you can see unfortunately it had a little messed up beak from hitting hitting uh, a window in buckhead so here's kind of how we do things roughly uh, and i'm going to sh show you how we do it um, the first thing that we use is a google calendar what we don't want is, you know, John Doe to go walk a certain route and me to go walk a certain route and us not know about it and walk it at the same time and kind of waste our effort. And so if you do decide to volunteer with us in Atlanta, we have this calendar. If you're outside of Atlanta for the time being, you're probably one of the only few people in your city doing it, so it's less of a concern. But I will work with you on developing a calendar or a plan for wherever you're turning, tuning in from. Let me see if I can escape out. 
hopefully you can see my screen and it's not the PowerPoint anymore. If you're still seeing my PowerPoint, someone scream at me in the comment box. But if you're unfamiliar with Google Calendar, it's a really simple shared calendar situation. And pretty much what I have people do is they just claim a route. So you can see our great volunteer, Kelly B, has already put down that, hey, she's going to be out this Saturday starting at around 7 in the Buckhead route. So that way, if you're someone who lives near Buckhead and you wanted to go survey, you can check that calendar before you go out. Or you can even contact, I'm getting a chat, so let me make sure I'm not. Aha, thanks, Michelle Hamner. Let me clear that up. That's our lovely Dottie. I'm using her, uh, her account today. How about now? Hopefully you should be able to see that calendar there. So Google Calendar is pretty basic. Um, I have documents to tell you exactly how to do it. Even if you're not tech savvy, please don't be put off. Um, again, there you can see where Kelly has in yellow. She's going to go out this weekend and she's going to look in Buckhead for birds. So I have documents I've created to walk through this process, but this is the first step. You decide you want to go out, let me mark it on the calendar. Um, some other things I will show you here, since it's going to be difficult to toggle, I'm going to show you all these references before I go back to my PowerPoint so that I don't have to toggle back and forth between the two. I have a shared folder here that I will also make available to anyone who's interested in volunteering or anyone looking in their part of the state. And the main things I have here are comments or copies of permits. So I've never, ever, ever had anyone ever be approached and be asked for their state or federal permits. But just in case, I have them for you. Uh, we can print them off or you can keep them digitally. Um, I have a PowerPoint, which is more or less this PowerPoint, in case you ever want to reference it again. But I have some things on here, like how to use Google Calendar. I will, there's a, again, a document to walk you through the whole thing. I have one here on what happens if you find an injured bird and how can you safely pick it up and what you should do with it and how to hold it and who to call. And I also have a thing which I'm going to go through, how to use Collector, our app, and use the online platform if needed for, reduce, or for reporting collisions. So that's all available. Again, this is a lot of information, so I'm just giving you the, the quick and dirty look at everything and, and please email me and we can talk more about this if you want to become more active in volunteering. We have an effort log. So one of the main things that's lacking from these best, um, these data sources we have of the number of birds that are dying, is just basic stuff like when did you go look and how long did you look and did you find anything? You know, a lot of the data is just of people reporting positive findings and not reporting when they don't find anything, which is very important information. So we just have a real basic effort log where I want to know what route did you do? Were you alone or were you with people? What'd you find? How long were you out there? Really basic. And again, this holds true for anyone even outside of Atlanta. Um, we will have this all set up for you. Our, our goal is to partner with some of our other Audubon chapters across the state, um, but that hasn't been set up yet. So I'm taking anyone from anywhere to get out and help us look. Another thing here, this is the online database that we have of collisions. So when I mentioned there are 1,700 collisions of 112 species, this is most of those collisions. Each green dot, unfortunately, is a bird that we have found. And so when you're using the app, this is what it's going to produce. If you're put off by the app, and again, if, if your screen is flashing because of me, I, I apologize. And if not, I'm sorry that I keep talking about it, <laughs> but my screen is flashing. Um, this is what the data looks like in our database. You can click on a certain dot here and it'll show you. So for example, last fall, we found a dead ruby-throated hummingbird on September 12th at eight in the morning at that building on Georgia Tech's campus. No photo was attached. Most of these or a lot of these should have pictures like there is a dead oven bird uh, almost the same day last year. You can click on these photos and see the photo of the oven bird. <clears throat> and again, in that document, I walked through the whole step of how to go about doing this. Um, how to use the app. So don't be scared off if you're a little tech phobic. There are many, many ways we can work around this um, from paper forms to uh, a geo form. Uh, I, can, I can get you there no matter uh, how nervous you are about, about using the app. So let me go back to my PowerPoint real quick. Those are just some of the resources we have.
Okay, so hopefully you should be seeing my PowerPoint again. So the very first step, I'm sorry I had to go out of order here for simplicity, but you, you set up your time on that Google Calendar. The next is you need to know what supplies we typically carry with us. So things are a bit different now, of course. I typically will give you um, Ziploc bags, brown paper bags, binder clips, gloves, pencils, data cards, a flashlight, and a cooler, and, and all sorts of paperwork that you need. I'm happy to set up a, a drop if you would like to get some of those things from me. But they are pretty cheap items, and with it being best for us to not interact as much or for you to take things that I've touched, it, it might be best if you could produce those yourself. Um, but we can definitely work on getting those to you or potentially maybe even finding a way to, to reimburse you um, if you have to buy some of those. But I have plenty of all those materials at our office. And so if you're in the Atlanta area or passing through, I'm happy to work on a, a handoff. But this is what we normally take with us, or at least what I take with me when I'm going out and looking for, for birds. Now, the main thing we need to talk about, of course, as I just alluded to, is, is COVID. Um, so we have a few basic considerations that we're asking you to think about if, if you want to volunteer at all this fall, and hopefully it's just this fall and not something you need to worry as much about next spring. Um, obviously, do not get out there if you're not feeling well, if you've tested positive. Please be smart. If you're one of my long-term volunteers who's paying attention right now, don't feel obligated to participate. You know, many people, even this past spring when we formally canceled, people wanted to get out. You know, it's so important to get out, get your exercise, get fresh air, um, and you wanted to help birds. So I completely understand and appreciate that. But don't feel obligated and don't do so if you're not feeling well. Um, many people do survey alone, but some people don't feel safe doing so, even though we've had no issues ever in any part of town. Um, but if you're not surveying alone, uh, or with someone from your immediate household, we, we recommend that you don't carpool. Um, again, we can't regulate that, but we want you to be as safe as possible when you're out on our surveys. If you are out um, with someone who's not in, in your household, please keep as much distance as possible. Uh, be careful of the public. I think most of our sidewalks are a little bit slower right now. Um, and do wear a mask, uh, please, when you're out and about. Please be safe. So one thing when I was deciding whether or not we were going to collect birds this fall was I reached out to the people who normally take our birds to see if they had specific recommendations um, for how they wanted us to pick up birds or to handle the data. And they did not. I was kind of surprised by that. And they, they did not have any certain precautions. And back in the spring, it seemed like it was a lot more problematic, uh, COVID sitting on a surface. We know it's still a problem, um, but maybe not as serious as we thought it was early on during the pandemic. So there are no specific recommendations, but there are some basic things you can do. As we're all doing, keep your hands clean. Um, consider washing before and definitely after you do a route. Uh, use a sanitizer as much as possible when you're out on a route. Um, you can consider wearing gloves, but of course you have to be cautious of what surfaces you're touching. Um, wearing gloves might make it less likely that if you're, uh, you know, positive, you're not rubbing it all over the bags and whatnot, but if you're touching surfaces with your gloves, then it doesn't really, doesn't really matter much, obviously. Um, and one thing which most people do anyways is consider using the bag to pick up a dead or injured bird like you do after your dog. Kind of invert the bag and, and use your hands. So nothing <laughs> super sophisticated, nothing you haven't heard before, just some basic smart things to think about if you would like to help us um, this fall. So you've got the calendar down, I've shared with you the documents, you've got your supplies, either, either I've given them to you or you've purchased some. So how do you go out and conduct your actual route? Um, again, where to do so? Anywhere and everywhere. If you're in Atlanta, we have routes in Buckhead, on campus of Georgia Tech, downtown, we have a few buildings in Dunwoody. City Hall is a place we, we have monitored and we'd like to continue to monitor, but that's a little bit difficult depending on access. But any other building, if, if you're um, still going to the office, or if you live somewhere near a set of buildings, and again, they don't have to be high-rise buildings. Any buildings that you think might be a problem after talking or, or listening to me talk tonight, um, I'm game to work something out with you and to, to figure out what we can learn about, about your area. So again, please do get in touch with me and, and don't be shy or put off if you're not in the immediate um, Atlanta area. When do we do these routes? Um, any day that you're able to do it. So if you're like, you know, hey, Adam, I can't do it four days a week. I can do it once a week or once a month. Um, I'll take it. I'm happy to have your help. 
Um, downtown is typically the route that we focus only on the weekends because of a very interesting and intense cleaning schedule that is still in place from the Olympics. Um, so that's mainly the weekends. However, with COVID, they, I'm betting they've cut that back. So any day you want to go out in downtown Atlanta, I'll, uh, uh, we will gladly uh, support you and we'll see what we find. But typically in a, on a normal situation, we look only during the weekends. The start time is always a bit tricky. We try to get out, you know, a half an hour to 45 minutes before sunrise, kind of at that first light. Um, but I don't want it to be so early, or if, if that early time is a deterrent to you, I'll take whenever you want to go out. Um, the issue is you want to get birds that hit throughout the night or first thing in the morning before the cleaning crews come. But oftentimes that's just before the real action picks up when birds are moving at first light. So it's, it's a bit of a tricky balance. Downtown, again, with the cleaning crews, we normally start pretty early around six. Um, but I'm also interested in, in late morning routes and afternoon routes. Um, some places like Chicago have such a good uh, volunteer pool that they can do the same route twice a day. We're not there yet, but if you all join me, <laughs> maybe we'll get there. Um, but normally early morning is when we like to get out. For the route, so if you happen to be doing Georgia Tech, Downtown, Buckhead, or Dunwoody, I have drawn these blue uh, routes in the app. And for the first time or two, you can actually just walk this route and it'll guide you if you're using your phone um, where to go and how to look. I'm happy to meet most of you out on these routes. Again, of course, masked up and, and with a safe distance. But I, I can um, meet up with you and, and you know keep our groups to just you and I are very, very small if you would like some assistance. Um, it's also relatively easy. You can get out there and just kind of look uh, for birds. Um, we do have a little bit of funding, so it's possible if you need to pay to park that I might be able to help you out with that. So just, just let me know. But you've picked your date, you have your supplies, you go to one of these areas, you're there in the morning and you walk this blue line and you start looking for birds. These are very specific uh, Buckhead and downtown considerations, but you know, parking is not easy. Um, park wherever you can, um, pay to park if you need to. Um, in Buckhead, I often park at the big Kroger complex here, the Disco Kroger, if you've been in Atlanta for a while, and I've never been towed there, but um, use your own judgment on that. I, I'm not recommending you go there. There's paid parking around, and again, I might be able to help you if you need a, a couple bucks to cover that, or if you're a very active volunteer, we can figure something out. But uh, be cautious of parking is the take home message here. So how to look for birds. Um, depending on where you are, it can be pretty obvious. If you're out in an uh, urban area, they might just be sitting right on the sidewalk. Here in Georgia, it's pretty common to have them in the pine straw at the base of the super reflective glass. You can see me there taking a photo of either a thrush or a gross beak, I can't tell, just to the left of that red bag. Sometimes they're real easy. Oftentimes they're pretty easy and they're just sitting out right like that. Um, sometimes it's a little bit trickier. There's a Tennessee warbler, I believe, kind of getting buried down in there. And I want you to look as thoroughly as you can and as thoroughly as you feel comfortable. Um, some people put on headlamps and they're out digging in these bushes. Uh, and I'm not one of those people. I look very thoroughly, but um, I do understand that there might be security or people working inside and you might not feel comfortable doing that. That is okay. Um, but do look as best as you can and as thoroughly as you can. Look up sometimes. Overhangs on buildings, you will find birds sometimes. And you're probably not going to be able to identify that to the species, but that's okay. Just note that you did find a bird at that location. Sometimes even like this little building, you'll find a, a tip of a feather or a foot hanging off. Um, this was a robin that we found on this little overhang. This is that same transparent walkway I showed you earlier, but you can kind of tell in the bottom here in the shadows, it's kind of cut in a little bit. So underneath these little ledges or underneath trash cans, sometimes people will pick up a dead bird and just throw it in a potted plant. So always be looking. Um, after you do the route a couple times, you start to develop that search image and you can find the birds with a little more ease and a little quicker. Um, but, but look anywhere. Look for areas where maybe leaf blowers have blown a pile of things or swept up. Sometimes I'll just leave the bird there. It's, it's not always the most enjoyable work, but it's very important and, and your help is, is greatly appreciated. Look in bushes on ledges. So here's an old hummingbird on this little ledge. 
I told you the story about the revolving door under trash cans and planters. So anywhere and everywhere you can find a bird that uh, might be uh, there needing help or, or has, has passed away. So I mentioned security and I mentioned cleaning crews. We are uh, very rarely, but occasionally approached by security guards. They have always been very nice, um, aware of the issue. They know about what's going on. The, the higher ups in the building are the ones who are clueless. They're helpful. They don't like seeing it from my experience. Um, you will have that paperwork if you need to show it to them. But they're all, again, from my um, encounters and from what I've heard from volunteers, it's great. They're always helpful. Um, many of them have even taken my business card and will call me when they find a bird and I can run over and pick it up. So um, it's great. Don't be scared. Just tell them what's going on. And, and normally they'll kind of be like, what are you doing? And then they let you go. Um, not let you go, but they, you know, they don't care anymore. Um, if you can consider talking to cleaning crews, sometimes they're a great wealth of knowledge and they'll tell you uh, how many birds they're finding. They know exactly when, oh, it's fall time. We get more in October. We get these little yellow ones or, you know, we only get three birds a year in the spring. They know all that stuff and it's a great way to, to get more information about them and about their building. So one thing, I don't think I have slides here, so I'll just talk about taking photos and collecting birds. And, and again, I know I'm giving you a lot of information here. Um, we normally do this presentation in person, which makes it a lot easier for me to show you how to do this. For taking photos, if you're using the collector app, I really like it if you can take a photo or two of the bird, as you see here to the right, and then one of the bird in relation to the building. It helps us get a clearer picture of, of what's going on and where we can find the bird. Um, collecting birds, um, I don't think I have, let me see if I have a slide here. I unfortunately don't have a slide of going through the actual app. That's something if you're interested, I'm gonna to have to walk you through, um, which isn't difficult, but uh, you have to download the app and play with it a little bit and uh, learn it that way. Um, so that's one thing that, again, it's, it's a bit of a disservice me having to do this as a webinar, but if you're new, the app is really user-friendly. If you're not a tech person, we will get you that. So I know some of you are not, don't be put off. So you can take photos and, and add them to your submission when you're collecting birds. When you're picking the bird up, again, you're going to use it like you're picking up after your dog. And then we do have a real basic piece of paper we ask you to slip in with him. That's just the date, the time, um, where you are. It's, it's real easy and I have all that for you uh, to share. Now, if you find, if you're in Atlanta at least, and you find a bird that is injured, um, the one thing we don't want to do is scare that bird right back into the window it just hit. Um, we normally have nets that I can allow you to take out. I'm not going to do that because I don't want us passing around the same item over and over. So if you have your own net or oftentimes if you're very careful, you can just walk up and grab the bird with your hand without it flying off. Again, I have that document that walks you through this process and tells you how to safely hold the bird. Um, oftentimes after you hold the bird for a while, um, it, its energy really picks up and you might be able to let it go at a safer location nearby, a park or a better green space. Um, you know, normally they're very active and alert. In a perfect world, we would get all the birds to the rehab centers, but I know that they're often busy and they're often far in Atlanta. Driving across town is not something many of us are able to do. Um, so that's when you would talk to me. The one thing I guess I didn't put in here, the first thing we do would be text Adam or call Adam and I will walk you through and help you with this process. If it's obvious the bird needs to go to a rehabber, we have many here in town from AWARE to for, uh, to for Pets Sake, which will both take birds. Nancy Eileen is a great rehabber who takes a lot of our birds. And the Chattahoochee Nature Center will take raptors, even though we don't really encounter those very frequently. But the main thing here, which I left off, is text Adam and I'm gonna help you with this whole process. Now with dead birds, again, I talked about collecting them in the bag and, and doing the data and using the app. However, that's in a normal world where you can just drive by my office and drop the birds off into a nice big cooler that I have waiting uh, there for these birds. But we are not at the office currently uh, because of COVID. However, I live nearby. So if you're willing to collect birds, I'm happy to facilitate a drop off with you at our office. They can be contactless, you can drop them off and I can pick them up five minutes later, but we do need to coordinate that way we're not leaving, you know, dead bird specimens lying around. Um, so this may require you to temporarily put them in your freezer. Some of you are not gonna wanna do that. Some of you are 
all on board but have a spouse or a roommate who's not going to be okay with that. Um, we can work that out as much as possible. Because of COVID, we have to be a lot more careful and thoughtful about how we're doing these drop-offs, drop-offs of birds. Um, if you're not willing to collect the birds, or if a normal time you would, but you don't want them in your freezer, which I understand, still report them in the app or still report them in dbird. But what we've been doing is disposing of the birds. That way, if someone does the same route or looks at the same building the next day, they're not double counting the same individual. Um, so these are a couple things that we're doing slightly differently this fall uh, with the coronavirus. So you're visiting Blue Heron or Aware or setting up a meeting for, for dead or injured birds. I briefly showed you the effort log, which is a very easy um, spreadsheet um, that we're doing for reporting that. And if you're a Georgia Audubon volunteer, I can help you with reporting your volunteer hours as well. This, don't worry about uh, writing down. This is all in the shared documents that I will send you, but this is how you can log on to that free app collector that I talked about. So uh, go ahead and discard this. I will get all this to you if you are interested in volunteering. And I mentioned if you're not someone who wants to use your phone or good with your phone, um, there are other ways to collect the data, including this geo form, which I can share this checklist or this um, PowerPoint with anyone who's interested. Um, and this is the online login our website to that map I showed you earlier with all the green dots. So again, I know I've said this many times, but we can find a way for you to participate no matter how uh, much you enjoy phones or laptops or whatever. We can, we use, need your help and, and we love your uh, volunteer effort. So here's my contact information that I promised to share. <clears throat> There's my new email, adam.betchel at georgiaautomon.org. The top phone number is our office line, but as I mentioned, we're very rarely in the office these days. Um, I figured those of you who are still with me after an hour and a half and all this stuff, I can share my cell phone with you guys. <laughs> you guys are the hardcore people who care about the birds. So there's my cell. If you find a dead bird, uh, feel free. I get so many text messages in the spring and fall. Of, hey, Adam, what's this bird I found? It's, you know, unfortunately dead here or live. I'm always happy to look at living, beautiful birds as well. Um, but those are my numbers. That's my email please reach out to me if you are interested in volunteering and want to learn more. If you're in a different part of Georgia and want to figure out what we can do in your city, let me know. If you just want to look around your neighborhood or your little small downtown, again, I am all ears. We're really hoping to grow this program and think about it in new creative ways now that we are a statewide organization. So please do not hesitate to reach out to me and uh, we will explore what is possible. And with that, I will take more questions. So one, one question I just got from Melissa was if I had any contacts in Columbia, South Carolina. The answer is kind of. Um, I was just on, uh, I participate in a National Audubon Collision um, group and we meet every other, every other month. It used to be once a month, now it's every other month, to talk about these issues. And Jen, Jennifer, I'm blanking on her name, she works for South Carolina Audubon, she uh, brought up a, a nice consumer guide that someone from South Carolina, I think in the Charleston area, drafted about some of the retrofit um, products that are available. And I reached out to her and said that South Carolina Audubon, or Audubon South Carolina and Georgia Audubon should think about collaborating on collisions, especially in the Augusta Aiken area, because there is a chapter there that kind of splits the, the border. And I believe that inspired her to reach out to some other <clears throat> Audubon South Carolina folks um, to see if this was something that maybe we could start partnering on or doing more in South Carolina. So my short answer is Audubon South Carolina is looking into it. There's a woman named Jennifer and I'm so sorry that I'm blanking on her last name. I'm sure you can find her on their website um, to try to see if there's more we could do there. So that would be my first thing would be reach out to Audubon South Carolina. I don't think there's much going on yet in the state uh, in relation to collisions but um, there should be, so that's great. Another question was about if this was, a, if there are similar projects to this in Raleigh, Durham. I believe so. So I know that a couple years ago, there was a, a, a project done at Duke that was looking at this issue specifically on campus. So it might've been more of a student-based project. And I think they use iNaturalist. So if you're familiar with the program iNaturalist, you might be able to find it there or if you do a Google search of, of Duke bird collisions, I bet you might find it. 
I don't know of anyone off the top of my head from Audubon, North Carolina, who's working on this, but I do think there's been some, some effort, mainly from the great, you know, cluster of universities that you have in that area. So that's all I can think of off the top of my head that you might want to check out to see if Duke has done something. Check out Audubon, North Carolina. Um, I know Curtis Smalling is the conservation director for the state for Audubon. He does great stuff, but I don't think he does much with collisions. So that's, that's the best I can think of. But for both of you, if they don't have anything, it, assuming you can carve out some time, it'd be a great thing to, <laughs> to think about starting. And that's like another great idea about iNaturalist. You know, we have this collector app, which I am lucky enough to be able to access because of my relationship or our connection with National Audubon. Um, but it does cost the average person. Um, but iNaturalist is a great program that is completely free and you can develop your own, pro your own study structure there. So if you do want to look to do something like this and you don't have access to collector or if your local or state Audubon isn't doing something, iNaturalist is something to, to consider. And that's the letter I followed by naturalist if you're not familiar with it. So yeah, that's, that's the most info I have for, for you folks in the Carolinas is see if your state offices are doing it I don't know of much from those two states, um, but I, I am trying to see if there's some overlap with our South Carolina folks. <clears throat> and there was a bit of a story from the Charlotte area, I think it was Charlotte, this past, last fall, I guess, maybe, where the NASCAR Museum, uh, there was a, a roosting, presumably a roosting flock of chimney swifts that um, either were flushed from their roost or couldn't find their roost, maybe had been capped when they came in to sleep for the night. And the NASCAR museum was so brightly lit that the Swifts were hitting the windows, hundreds of them. Um, the good news was many of them didn't die. The Swifts weren't hitting that hard, but they, Swifts can't take off from the ground because they have pretty much no legs. They're very uniquely adapted birds. So um, if you look up NASCAR Hall of Fame and birds, it'll probably be the first hit um, that happened. Well, again, I appreciate you all so much for giving me this much time uh, during, during your weeknight evening. Um, please do reach out. Any questions, any interest in participating, any, you know, you need help fixing your own home or you want to think about doing something at your workplace. Uh, I, I'm, I'm your guy here in Atlanta and in Georgia, and I'm happy to uh, help as much as possible. So. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Please stay safe. And I hope you will consider uh, volunteering for us or looking for birds uh, across Atlanta. So thanks, everyone. Good birding.